Since its inception, Alliance Health has held tight to the principle that people can and do recover from behavioral health illnesses. To make this principle a reality, we are working to nurture a culture within our organization that is focused on and responsive to the individuals we serve. To do this requires a rethinking of people's capacity to recover, the services available to them, and the role of providers and community stakeholders in facilitating the recovery process. We must continue to take steps to ensure a common understanding of recovery among our providers and across the community at large. At Alliance, we're working towards a recovery-focused system of care collaborating to provide an effective network of resources for community members and families experiencing emotional distress and disability related needs so they can heal, have hope for the future, and live personally meaningful lives. To this end, we're building a continuum of residential options that allow individuals to live as they choose, to experience the dignity of risk, and to have the independence and life experience all of us want. What follows is one of a series of six trainings that provide some basic tools needed to support the people we serve with the dignity and respect they deserve to improve our communities by allowing them to experience all of their citizens' different gifts and to enjoy inclusive neighborhoods that embrace the value of every member. Before we can talk about creating a recovery-oriented system of care for our members and group living, we need to talk about first what is recovery-oriented system of care. Recovery-oriented system of care services shall be evidence-based, community-based, recovery-oriented, flexible, and individualized focuses on helping individuals increase their abilities to recognize and deal with situations that may otherwise result in crises and focus on increasing and strengthening individuals networks of community and natural supports as well as to use these supports for crisis prevention and intervention. Now looking at group living specifically let's better understand how we got to the Olmstead settlement. The Olmstead case is a landmark Supreme Court case that arose from a woman named Lois Curtis, she had a mental illness, and she was confined to a psychiatric hospital um, for several years. Her doctors, after the first year her treatment was completed, said she should be moved to a community program. However, she remained confined for several years after because there was nowhere for her to go. She filed a lawsuit in 1995 uh, against Tommy, Mr. Tommy Olmstead, who is the uh, commissioner of the Georgia Human Rights Department and the action was a, a Title II ADA complaint. So she was challenging the fact that she was being discriminated against under the ADA because of her disability. She won, but the, but the department appealed to the Supreme Court. And in 1999, the Supreme Court explained, and I'll quote, institutional placement of persons who can handle and benefit from community settings perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that people so isolated are incapable and unworthy of participating in community life. Confinement in institutions severely diminishes the everyday life activities of individuals, including family relations, social contacts, work options, economic independence, educational advancement, and cultural enrichment. So this case was pivotal under the ADA to recognize disabilities that are protected under the ADA. So Olmstead and similar cases following requires that all public entities, including the state of North Carolina, administer services, programs, and activities for people with disabilities in the most integrated setting appropriate to the person's needs. Specifically, the law requires to provide services in the community for eligible people with disabilities when, one, such services are appropriate, two, the person does not oppose community-based treatment, and three, community-based services can be reasonably accommodated. North Carolina is one of several states involved in lawsuits with the federal government. After an investigation, the Department of Justice determined that North Carolina had failed to provide services to individuals with mental illness in the most integrated setting in violation of the ADA, relying unnecessarily on institutional settings, violating the civil rights of people with disabilities. In 2012, North Carolina entered into a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice 
requiring North Carolina to transform its mental health system from one that is heavily reliant on large institutional settings to one that is focused on providing community-based services and supportive housing that enable thousands of individuals to live, work, and participate fully in community life. Alliance's emphasis on mental health group home facilities is directly related to Olmstead. We wanna be sure that the people living there understand that they have a choice, and if they're willing, Alliance can help them live more independently through quality supportive housing. In 2015, we contracted with the Technical Assistance Collaborative Tech, and we had three questions that we wanted them to explore and answer for us in terms of how we utilized our residential continuum. We wanted to know what the quality and capacity of each type of, of residential care was. How were, how were people accessing it? Were they getting the help and the support and the treatment that they needed in that type of care. The second question that we wanted them to ask, answer for us is how did we, how did people enter into a residential option? Where were they coming from? How long did they stay? Uh, what happened along the way for them? Were there points in time where they were able to move along some type of continuum that we were paying for? And then the third question that we wanted them to answer for us is, so how much was it costing us to have our current design of, of residential care? And as part of their report, they, they looked at three distinct target populations for us, adults with mental illness and substance use, adults and children with IDD, and then children and adolescent services such as PRTFs. And upon the completion of the report, there were several things that they found um, for us. And, and in some ways, this was what we already knew, but we were able to quantify that across disability groups, um, looking at the needs and challenges of how people were served and how people exited residential care into community living options, which is definitely part of the philosophy and practice of Alliance. The second thing that they uh, were able to um, to do for us is some really cross-cutting recommendations. If we wanted to redesign our system by disability group, by age group, what would it take? What would that look like? What would an investment be? What would partnerships be? And then the third kind of insightful uh, um, recommendation that they had for us that really began to set the, the roadmap to where we are now is that it was very clear that we had an over-reliance on group care. People came from the hospitals, they came from other settings, went into group care, and just never, either never left or never moved along a continuum um, that eventually got people to where we wanted, which is community living. In looking at the recommendations out of the TAC report, and as I mentioned, it was very comprehensive, it was very detailed, but there were themes across disability groups and across different types of residential settings that really began to resonate with us about the changes that we would need to make. Um, the first is that as people enter group care and stay there, there was never a point in time where we assess what their individual um, housing need and preference. Is this really where you wanna stay? Are there other options that you would want um, want to explore such as a step down or having your own apartment. And that was the, probably the biggest thing that we really began to focus on is people came into group care, they stayed in group care, and they often languished in group care um, without us really having the spirit of Olmstead to come to them and say, you're making enough progress, or is this where you want to be? Or why do you even think that you're still here? Um, the second theme out of this report is that we really did, had not done a good job of setting service standard and expectations that move people to independent living. So when you thought about from a group home provider perspective, this was really where people were going to continue to live. We didn't have the expectation or the requirement that said, you're going to help this person learn independent living skills so that we can eventually have them move out on their own. This is just where people lived. 
And then the third thing um, it, that really um, also helped inform our roadmap to where we are now is that we had not really thought about what were the wraparound services and supports that would be necessary to help people step down and eventually move into the housing of their choice. So we have somebody in a group home that says, yes, I'd like to move. They may or may not have been involved in treatment services while they're in the group home. And now we're saying, okay, what's it gonna take? What do you need? What's available? How do we make it happen for you as you, as you move through this continuum into your own apartment? Since 2015, when TAC completed this report, we've been busy looking at the recommendations and what it would take to eventually get us to where we are now, which was a complete redesign of our residential services. One of the first things that was a theme in this report for us is that we needed to have a more active partnership and collaboration with developers. Accessing housing inventory was gonna be key for the people that we serve who are often marginalized or discriminated against in housing. And so there was no reason, no point in having this redesign if we couldn't actually move people into housing. And so we spent the last several years uh, brokering these relationships, making investments where we needed to, to create some options for people um, as they thought about exiting uh, group homes. And one of the things that Olmstead talks about in its ruling is the importance for communities, health plans, payers to repurpose how it spends the money. So we were spending an incredible amount of money in residential care, not seeing the outcomes that we wanted to in terms of people engaging in their own recovery, people having the choice of where they wanted to live. We were spending a lot of money for people to just live in a group home. Um, and while that may not be true across the board, it was true for most people. And so we began to look at what would it take? What would it cost? What do we need to build to repurpose existing funds? This redesign was not about new money and spending an exorbitant amount of money. It was spending our money differently um, to give people the wraparound supports and the housing choice in the communities and neighborhoods in which they wanted to live. And it became incumbent upon us to have the relationships with affordable housing developers in these desirable places that people would want to live so that they could access housing of their choice. As you see, there are several avenues available for community living options. A member is not required to live within these options in any specific order, but everybody's ultimate goal should be permanent supported housing. Our current focus is on persons with primary mental illness residing in group living settings. The goal is to implement a comprehensive recovery oriented system of care built on housing choice and access to safe and affordable housing, wraparound services and supports that promote community inclusion and quality of life, creating and funding alternative models to long-term congregate living, and building provider competency for tenancy supports that are integrated with treatment interventions. Some of you might be asking why this change and why now? Alliance has developed supported housing expertise and partnerships in the community. Alliance has permanent housing inventory and vouchers in our high need counties. To honor the intention of the Olmstead Act of 1999, currently redirecting funds to bolster and build other parts of supported living and subsidies for longer term financial assistance. Creating a new care management model that can support the intensity of community transition and incorporating new thinking and emerging best practices like community inclusion. I think it's the same reason why it's so important to us or to anyone else for that matter. I mean, think about how much you rely on your support network. Think about how much you, um, whether it's your church family or your gym family or your um, you know, school, work, whatever. I mean, just think about how much your community is, is important, how important your community is to you. Like most of my friends I've made at work or, or gym or you know wherever. And I rely on those people you know, every single day, um, whether it's my family and my friends or my coworkers and colleagues, um, you know, those people are a big part of my life. And without them, you know, I, I would have a pretty difficult time uh, with some things. So I think all, you know, think about the things that we take for granted and just, you know, how important our support, ne support network is once we think about it. Um, you know, that's the same for our members. I have a 
opportunity and privilege to work with a gentleman living in a group home um, who, when we started working together, you know, definitely wanted to be more involved in the community, um, wanted a stronger support system, um, you know, just wasn't really sure how to go about doing it. Um, so we, we ended up just, at, at this point, we just started going, going to the gym um, and, and walking. And through going to the gym, um, he was able to meet a couple of people, um, you know, make some connections at the gym and got a part-time job. And then through that also joined some support networks. Um, I believe it was a fitness club, uh, like just walking, um, you know, made friends and connections through the part-time job. And after doing that for a little while and, you know, really having that support network that, that especially that unpaid support network, um, and so many people around and telling him what he could do rather than what he couldn't do. Um, he was able to, we linked him with VR um, and he ended up going to CDL school and getting his CDLs. Um, and then, you know, through the CDL school, you know, through the truck driving school and all that stuff, he was able to make connections to where I think he had a job within 30 days um, of graduating from getting his CDLs and went from living in a group home on SSI um, to, you know, just absolutely thriving and is now, last time I had heard from him, he was off of SSI and had his own place and was, uh, you know, driving big rigs across the country from California to North Carolina. It's good for, it's good for the member, it's good for the, the community, um, you know, and just exactly truly feeling as part of the community and being a part of the community, having the same opportunities as everyone else, um, you know, and, and just being able to form those relationships and, and networking and um, develop that natural support system.